we are ready to be active on the foreign exchange market if the Swiss franc would become very too strong, massively overvalued, or when the Swiss franc would become too weak. We are seeing signs of a slowdown. Uh, growth in uh, mainland GDP has slowed. We've had other previous experiences where you know, chancellors have gone for growth and they both ended in tears. And I must say, I expect the same sort of thing will happen with Kvarteng's policy. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Rome. We're covering the elections. Congratulations, everyone. It's Friday. If you've made it through the week, you have another difficult week coming next week, but at least it's almost the weekend. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Market maelstrom. Well, we look at equities, yield surging, stock sinking, and the dollar batters peers as central banks around the world unleash recession fears. Italy votes. We're live in Rome in what could be a historic election. That's on Sunday. We'll get, of course, the results on Monday. And fiscal boost. The new UK Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, is set to unveil, unveil its stimulus plans today. So first thing is first, and frankly, everything. All of these political foreign affairs issues, the rising energy costs, the cost of living is really playing out in this mega battle amongst central banks. So that's playing out on the markets. I'm looking at stocks and also U.S. equity futures extending declines at the end of a week that underscored expectations overall for, of course, tighter monetary policy and a slowing global economy. We were speaking to our Christina Kino, and I urge everyone also to go on our live blog. It's both on the terminal but on the website where she goes... And, and some of the things she asks is basically, do we now need a plaza court? If you look at what's happened to yen this morning, um, after they tried to intervene, it's very clear that that's short-lived. So if you're not going to act in coordination, where do you actually end up? And that's really up to the G10, G10 currencies to either try and fight the Fed or even go higher than what we're expecting. Investors flocking to cash, shunning almost every other asset class as they turned the most pessimistic since the global financial crisis. That's according to Bank of America strategists. Now, we also have some manufacturing PMI, um, pretty much as expected, 48.5, uh, and the forecast was the same. So that's a bit of data. We'll go on to Italy in a second. I don't know if we have the European map. If we do, I'm going to get my sunglasses. The beauty of Rome guys, is really unprecedented. So even if the markets are falling out of bed, you're in a better mood if you're here in Rome and then maybe if you're somewhere where it's raining and gloomy. Uh, this is a picture we're seeing quite a lot of red across the board. I think out of the 19 industry groups that make up the stocks 600, nothing is actually gaining in today's trading session. The 10-year Treasury yield holding near 3.7%. So this week has seen a blitz of interest rate hikes in an ongoing campaign by central banks to crush inflation, even as they run the mounting risk of driving their economies into recession. Now from the United States to the Philippines, policymakers lifted their benchmark borrowing costs during a three-day window that made it clear that their chief worry is the hottest run of inflation since the 80s. We have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a painless way to do that. There isn't. Inflation has been um, higher than projected. Uh, it has increased uh, rapidly uh, in the past few months. Uh, and that's also why uh, a large uh, policy rate hike was warranted at the, this time. We do not exclude that further interest rate hikes are necessary. We do not, uh, we are not very specific when exactly and to what extent. To prevent price pressures from broadening in this way, we continue to urge timely non-monetary government interventions to mitigate the impact of the supply side pressures. Now we're joined by Fabrizio Pagani, Global Head of Economics at Musinic & Co. Fabrizio, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it's been such an incredible, fast-moving week that it's quite difficult for the markets to catch their breath. Is there now an understanding that King Dollar will just go ever higher? Possibly, possibly. Today is really <laughs> hanging It's rough lot. for the others. <laughs> yeah, it's rough for the others. Um, let me say, there is a lot of volatility in markets, right? And, um, uh, I mean, these hikes across the week and across the continents have been quite, quite momentous. At the same time, I have to spend a couple of words in defense of central banks. I mean, they have told us. <laughs> <laughs> they have told us repeatedly, and I think the, 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 you know, the, 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 the word central bank, which is the Fed, in, in Jackson Hole, has been, Powell has been very, very clear that they, they will fight inflation, period. 
But so what's the so I spoke actually when I was in New York, I spoke to a former central banker who shall remain anonymous, and he says, look, yields should go to five percent. If if you just believe what the, what central banks have been telling us, we're going to see treasuries at five percent. Why is it taking so long? Why are the markets so hesitant to reprice? I, well, there are two, two aspects. I think, I think markets have been uh, a bit reluctant in repricing because they didn't believe the central bank's determination. And indeed, at the beginning of, of the year and last year, there was some uncertainty on how, how, you know, how strong and uh, uh, determined central banks were in, in, in hiking. Uh, you know, the, the, this combination of, of, of hiking rates and ending QE was a bit complicated to, 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 yeah. to, 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 to handle. Can we agree on the economy, and maybe we disagree, that inflation is actually the worst? Because it kills especially, you know, the benessere, the, you know, the, the living of the people that are just about making it. And so politically, this has to be dealt with. We can agree on that, definitely. At the same time, I think inflation in Europe and in the US is different, and we should never forget that. In Europe, is really energy. I mean, there is a recent study by Bruegel, you know, the think tank, mm -hmm. which shows that if prices will go back to February, energy prices will go back to February levels, which were higher than, than usual, of course, already very high, inflation will go down to 3.8%, which is high but bearable. So, I mean, in Europe, is really, is really energy. Energy is king. I know, but energy, then it's cost of living. So I don't know if you've asked, you know, asked for a raise recently. If not, you should. Mr. Musinek, you're going to get a call from Fabrizio <laughs> once we get off air. But the point is that there's a spiral. And once you lose that inflation spiral, then central banks are powerless. That's true. This is why the Powell is, you know, is, is, is so critical for Powell to, you know, to, 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 to rein these uh, inflation expectations. And it's all about uh, inflation expectations. Basically, the fact that you, you if an inflation expectation that you take decision thinking that the prices will be higher and higher, you know, for, for, for a very long period. And this is really destructive for the economy. Can we really avoid a recession in the U.S. and globally? I think we may, we may, it's a narrow path, but we may have a technical recession. So I, I, I always say that we want a recession which is an economist's recession. So an, an, a recession which is really felt and, and gauged exclusively by, by, by technicians, but people perhaps uh, can, can, can go ahead with just as low as, as low down. But it's a narrow path. Um, Fabrizio, going back to, you know, these currencies and also, you know, King Dollar, there's more and more talk about a possible plaza accord, that the other country needs to come together, and if they don't do it together, if it's not coordinated, then, then nothing will happen. It won't make a difference if the Bank of Japan does this or the Swiss Bank does that. I think there are two, two sides, because at the same time, this, coordinate, this coordinated tightening of, of monetary policy is helping, because we have a, an, an, a, an inflation pressure across the world, so with the, perhaps the exception of, the exception of Japan. So it, 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 it helps and may be more effective to do it all together in a synchronized way. At the same time, I understand, and Powell somehow confirmed in the, in the press conference, that they are talking to each other <laughs> all the time, the central banks, you know, in, in Basel and in other four, the, yes, the FSB and, and the Basel Committee and so on. And, 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 and so, on. so um, I don't know if we need a formal uh, agreement, but certainly uh, we have always to be mindful that the, 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 you know, the financial system is so fragile and uh, this type of, of volatility and this type of movement can, can be really uh, damaging. All right, Fabrizio, thank you so much. Don't go anywhere. Also, because the view is beautiful, but we have to talk about Italian politics. This is a problem with Italy. It's always so beautiful <laughs> that you, don't, you never really quite understand the severity <laughs> of what could happen. <laughs> Fabrizio Pagani, Global Head of, Muse of Economics at Musenic & Co. Now, coming up, Italy goes to the polls this weekend, so we'll have plenty more on that next. And this is Bloomberg. Business, economics, politics. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Rome, of course, looking 
at the French, uh, the Italian elections. Oh my goodness, we've had no sleep. The Italian elections, but of course, they will have a huge implication for all of Europe, including France and Germany. Now, we're also getting some breaking news on the markets. The UK FTSE 250 has fallen to the lowest level since November 22. Now, the difference, of course, between the 250 and the FTSE 100 is that the FTSE 100 is extremely rich when it comes to big multinationals. It also has BP, so it has a huge uh, resource, natural resource contraction, which sometimes doesn't capture the full effect of pound weakness or concerns about the UK economy. Now, the political landscape in Europe is shifting. It goes to the polls this weekend. After over a year of relative stability under Mario Draghi, Italians and investors face uncertainty as to what lies ahead in their government. We're back with Fabrizio Pagani, Global Head of Economics at Musinic & Co. Fabrizio, thank you so much for sticking around. So we cannot talk about the polls, but it is uh, very likely that Giorgia Meloni becomes the new prime minister with this right-wing coalition. I was at Piazza del Popolo. I saw Silvio Berlusconi, uh, Matteo Salvini, Giorgia Meloni, all giving some, some pretty feisty speeches. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for investors? I think investors will look at two things. They will look at the key, the, the, the key positions in government, particularly who will be the minister of finance, and will look at what, uh, what, the, what the government does in the first uh, two, three months, particularly in the implementation of the uh, next generation EU, EU uh, national plan and the budget law, which is due by the end of, by the, end of the year. Uh, so far, I mean, if you look at the program of, of, of the different parties and different coalition, there is not, not, particularly in economic terms, there is nothing particularly shocking. Yes. So there is nothing, but not, there is not like, you know, five years ago or, or ten years ago when they're really anti-euro and uh, uh, anti-European Union uh, strong, strong uh, uh, positions. Today, the, everything is more moderate. I know, but the, the, so the concern, and we know Giorgia Meloni is trying to be a conservative, basically mainstream politician. Mm -hmm. But underneath that, there are still undercurrents of Euroscepticism from the past, of Italy first, of closing down the borders. So the danger is what? In the next couple of months that they that you know you that they somehow change and you see the true colors or do you think they'll stay the course I think the danger is probably in the medium term and longer term if they if they stay in power for a, for, for a long period of uh, basically feeding up anti-European sentiment in a in a more subtle way so you know in having frictions with European Union uh, and in having you know a sort of complain mentality vis-a-vis -vis 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 the, the European Union, the central bank, and, and so on. And the second danger is structural reform. I mean, we are committed to yes. do structural reform according to the National Plan on Resilience uh, and Recovery. So we, and, 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 and it's a very long list, uh, we, we are not certain how much determination there will be by, by the new government, particularly if it's a centre-right uh, coalition, in doing uh, structural reform. And that will be scrutinised very closely by investors. Uh, so, Fabrizio, you made, of course, this excellent point that a lot will depend on who's finance minister. From the rumours I hear, but you're much closer to this than I am, from the media also talking, it seems like it could be a mainstream name. Right. I mean, I think there's Lorenzo Binismaghi on a possible list that nothing's confirmed. You have ex-bankers. Like, who, who do you think it will be? <laughs> I can't comment on names. <laughs> but you think but, it's uh, someone that the market, you know, could know or at least would be reassuring? I think, I, I, I think Giorgia Meloni is, uh, is, uh, is a skilled politician. And if she will be, if it's, it's always an if, of course. if she will be the, 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 the premier, she will uh, choose someone who's probably uh, uh, well known by market and, and, and accepted yes. by investors. So the, the, one of the difficulties, of course, and again, she has said, but without freaking out Europe, that she needs to renegotiate what you were talking about, this recovery fund, because we're going into winter, and maybe a lot of our international audience doesn't realize exactly you know, how difficult here um, in Italy it will be because of the closeness to Russia, to Russian gas, to Russian energy. I mean, should they spend a little bit more, given the high debt? I mean, the, you know, there are two things. One is the national plan, which is no. under the, the, the next generation EU, which is a huge amount of money, yes. which is two, around 200 billion. Yeah. And this is more a question of really implementing it. We don't need more money, you know, and you can, you can adjust at the margin. Yes. And uh, some, 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 some changes can be made in accordance you know, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the commission, you know, talking with the commission, negotiating with the, with, with the commission. The second aspect is the budget. And on the budget, uh, 
Uh, Giorgia Meloni seems, from, from what she's yeah. saying, quite conservative. For example, she doesn't, she doesn't seem to, to accept that there will be a revision of the budget in, uh, with a fiscal yeah. expansion in order to uh, uh, shore up families and, and, and companies further from, uh, from, uh, from energy prices. Um, Fabrizio, there's also a new tool, of course, by the European Central Bank saying that they can intervene if there's a widening of the spread. I mean, this would not be used, am I correct, if, if the spreads widen because of politics in Italy? That's a, that's a good question. You know, <laughs> it's a bit like the revolver of Chekhov. When you put it on the scene, <laughs> someone has to, <laughs> someone you, has to, to use get. it. So we have this, I think, frankly, I think this TPI is a great instrument. And I've been, <laughs> and I've been advocating and, 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 and praising it since the beginning. Uh, because I think it, it, it's a, we already see its effects. Because the, only the fact that it exists, even if the mechanic may be a bit difficult to, to you know, to, 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 to really put it in place, is, is, is having an effect on, on, on market. Let me just say that, you know, to, to the old Euro skeptics in, in Italy, uh, the, the, the ECB has been buying around 300 50 billion of, of Italian debt in the last couple of years. I, I mean, I, that should be enough to be <laughs> not Eurosceptic at least. All right, uh, Fabrizio, <laughs> thank you so much. Fabrizio Pagani there saying it as it is, uh, Global Head of Economics at Musenic and Co. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, from Italy throughout the day. Also coming up, we bring you more from Rome as Italians head to the polls over the weekend. We'll look at the role that inflation and energy will play in their decisions. We speak to the former ENI chief executive, Paolo Scaroni. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition of Fronti L'Aqua here in Rome ahead of the elections on Sunday. Now, let's talk about energy as well. We will talk a little bit later about Italian politics, but we're joined now with a man who understands energy and also the close connection of Europe and Putin like no one else. He is Paolo Scaroni. He's chairman of AC Milan, deputy chairman of Rothschild, but for many years he is, he was the former chief executive, of course, as any. Paolo, as always, thank you so much thank for coming on. Many people don't understand the relationship, for example, of Gazprom and certain prices, the fact that I think they pay less, the Germans pay less than the Italians or the French with some of the PAP flows. When do you see a resolution of the conflict that would lead to more normalcy in terms of energy flows between Russia and Europe? Uh, this, uh, I would probably say never. No, never. Ne never is not a world that makes a lot of sense, but meaning by never, I, I say for maybe 10 years or something okay. like that. Uh, this relationship which made Russia as the Texas of Central Europe, because in fact it has been the Texas of Central Europe for 70 years, is finished now. So what does that mean for a country like Italy that has hugely reliance and close ties? I know uh, Italy is looking for oil elsewhere. It's going for countries in, for example, Africa, where it has to pay a lot more for its energy. No, oil is not the problem. The it's issue gas. is all around yeah. gas. No? Now, luckily, Italy has other pipelines with Algeria, with Libya, and with Azerbaijan, which are providing some gas. And oddly enough, we still have a flow of Russian gas, which crossed the Ukraine, and arrives in Italy. And this gas, which is roughly 25 million cubic meters a, a day, if it continues, it, uh, we have uh, the assurance that Italy yeah. will not suffer during the next winter. But how difficult will be the next winter or the one after? I mean, I remember Mario Draghi saying, you know, we have to choose between peace and having air conditioning. What happens in the winter where we're choosing heating? Well, uh, personally, I think that the consumption of gas will be dropping so much, particularly from industry, that we will not have a problem of supply. Now, of course, we have a problem of prices, which is a completely different issue, because prices are really at a level which is unsustainable for families and for business. And uh, we need to know what the Italian government and possibly the European Union will do to, to try to offset this uh, unbelievable situation. If you look at uh, this far-right coalition, I was in Piazza del Popolo yesterday, we'll talk about it a little bit more uh, later. We have, you know, three main actors in this, Giorgia Meloni, Matteo Salvini, and Silvio Berlusconi, that have ties with Donald Trump and that have ties with Putin, because this country suddenly become much more friendly towards Russia. Well, let me say that all politicians had a, a tie with Putin. All Italian politicians, since ever, since the Soviet Union. So 
these three have ties with Putin, but Prodi has ties with Putin. Uh, even uh, Lekta has a very good relationship with Putin, had a very good oh, relationship yeah. with Putin, of course. Now, uh, this has nothing to do with the supply of gas, of course. Okay, we'll talk a lot more about that. Paolo, thanks so much. Paolo Scaroni, chairman of AC Milan, deputy chairman of Rothschild, and of course, former any chief executive. He stays with us, so we'll listen actually to the UK mini budget together, and then we'll get back to Italian politics ahead of that vote on Sunday. This is Bloomberg. Market maelstrom yield surge, stocks sink, the dollar batters peers as central banks around the world unleash recession fears. Italy votes, we're live in Rome in what could be a historic election. We'll get, well, people vote on Sunday, we'll get results on Monday. And fiscal boost, the new UK Chancellor, Quasi Quartang, is set to unveil its stimulus plans imminently. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Rome. We've been talking about, of course, energy, energy in Europe uh, as it pertains to Russian energy. Shortly, we'll hear also from Quasi Quartang on what we should be seeing in terms of fiscal spending to cap tax cuts uh, to get through the winter months. Now, I have to say it's pretty ugly. I keep on saying congratulations if you've made it to Friday because it was a brutal week for volatility. Uh, stocks and U.S. equity futures actually extending declines at the end of a week that really underscored through all central banks, through all the world, expectations uh, for tighter monetary policy and a slowing global economy. Now, strategists are giving up a year and rally for European stocks. Goldman Sachs, for example, slashed its year-end target for the S&P to 3,600 from 4,300 earlier. So let's go back to Paolo Scaroni, chairman of AC Milan and deputy chairman of Rothschild. He was former any. Paolo, thank you so much for staying with us. We were talking before, of course, about the relationship and energy between Italy and uh, Russia. What happens in Italian politics? So on Sunday, we cannot talk about the polls. Let's not talk about the polls, but it's widely expected that Giorgia Meloni will be prime minister. What will she be like? Well, nobody really knows what she would be like. She has said several things. She will maintain the main position of the, the same position of Italy towards Russia on the Ukrainian uh, on the Ukrainian conflict. She said that we not make an, an excessive deficit. So let's say for the time being, he's saying very reasonable things. But in any case, you know, I'm not particularly worried because. Uh, any any prime minister in Italy has to face the ECB, which will uh, decide how many Italian bonds will buy. It, the, the European Union, which will put uh, a red light on any big change on the recovery plan. Plus NATO is not under discussion, plus the markets, of course. Yes. So in total, nothing terrible will happen. But we could also see, and you know, what struck me in Piazza del Popolo is that the rhetoric, and I understand that this right-wing coalition wants to focus on values, right? It's the old Italy, it's quite very Trumpian in certain cases, it's almost like Viktor Orban. So what makes the market believe that they will stick within these parameters, right, in accessing the $1.9 uh, billion from the EU and not spending too much when we have a cost-of-living crisis and staying in the, in the Eurozone? Well, I think I think I'm sure that this will st they will stay within these boundaries. No doubt okay. about that. They have to do it. They said they will be doing. Of course, they will be facing big challenges, including the fact that the cost of living is going up and the cost of energy is going up quite dramatically in the country. This will be one of their challenges. The second challenge will be to find people to fill the government. Particularly, uh, Meloni doesn't have a, a tradition of government. So where? Will, will her find the ministers, yeah. the, the secretaries of state, etc. That's a big question for everyone. So who will be finance minister? Uh, nobody <laughs> knows. I certainly <laughs> don't know. I'm wondering if she knows. Um, in any case, she will pick among professor university, people who got experience, somebody yeah. coming from Goldman Sachs or maybe Morgan Stanley. It's always I really Goldman Sachs, right? They always end up in charge in Italy. I said Morgan Stanley as well. <laughs> okay, Morgan Stanley. Were you at either? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, Paolo, when you look at you know the concerns that Italians have right now, can she deliver on why she gets elected while staying within those parameters? Yes, she, I think she will deliver. And I have to tell you, the fact that we make a change 
is positive. You no, know? it's positive because this country needs some fresh air after many years in which we didn't have much fresh air. Fresh air. Of course, Draghi was a lot of fresh air, but was not elected. And we need to have fresh air from politics as well. Uh, Paolo, when you see, so of course, you know, the cost of living crisis and all of the concern, do you expect the European Central Bank to stick with Italy? I know they have this tool to intervene uh, if there's, you know, a, a widening of the spread with German bonds. What if it's something that's brought on politically? I'm sure that the ECB will take into consideration the fact that Italy cannot be the problem for the euro. So they will do what is needed in order to keep the spread between the, the, the Italian bonds and the German bonds to a, within a certain limit. No doubt about that. Then I'm wondering if the European Union should not make another recovery plan for the energy issues that all the Europeans are facing today. What do you see the prescription? How would you fix it to, today? So we have the recovery plan. It's, this is a lot of money. We have certain trajectory that Mario Draghi put us on. What does Italy need to grow their businesses, make sure that actually everyone is more comfortable? Because there's, a, you know, if you look at um, GDP, it's not that bad, but it's always certain families that have it. It's really the youth that seem to be left behind all the time. We have to go on with the Draghi agenda, no doubt about that. In, in particular, we have to go on because otherwise we will not get the money from the recovery plan. No. And this is a very positive agenda for the country. But at the same time, we have to face the challenge of energy. Paolo, I need to cut you off because we're also getting the UK Chancellor quasi Quartang with his mini budget. Here he is. Their already expensive energy bills could reach as high as £6,500 next year. Mr. Speaker, we were never going to let this happen. Yeah. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has acted with great speed to announce one of the most significant interventions yeah, 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 the British state yeah, yeah, yeah. has ever made. People need to know that help is coming, and help is indeed coming. We're taking three steps to support families and businesses with the cost of energy. Firstly, to help households, the energy price guarantee will limit the unit price that consumers pay for electricity and gas. This means that for the next two years, the typical annual household bill will be £2,500. For a typical household, that is a saving of at least £1,000 a year based on current prices. We are continuing our existing plans to give all households £400 off bills this winter. So taken together, Mr Speaker, we are cutting everyone's energy bills by an expected £1,400 this year, and millions of the most vulnerable households will receive additional payments, taking their total savings this year to £2,200. Yeah, 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 yeah. Secondly, as well as helping people, we need to support the businesses who employ them. The energy bill relief scheme will reduce wholesale gas and electricity prices for all UK businesses, charities and the public sector, such as schools and hospitals. This will provide a price guarantee equivalent to the one provided for households for all businesses across the country. Thirdly, energy prices are extremely volatile. Uh, rising and falling erratically every hour. This creates real risks to energy firms who are otherwise viable businesses. Those firms help supply the essential energy needed by households and businesses. So to support the market, we are announcing the Energy Markets Financing Scheme. Delivered with the Bank of England, this scheme will provide a 100% guarantee for commercial banks to offer emergency liquidity to energy yeah. traders. Yeah. Mr Speaker. The consensus amongst independent forecasters is that the government's energy plan will reduce peak inflation by around five percentage points. Yeah. It will reduce yeah. the cost of servicing index-linked government debt and lower wider cost of living pressures. And it will help millions of people and businesses right across the country with the cost of energy. Let no one doubt, Mr Speaker, that during the worst energy crisis in generations, this government is on the side of the British people. Yeah. The Bank of England are taking further steps to control inflation, acting again only yesterday. And I can assure the House that this government considers the Bank of England's independence to be sacrosanct. Yeah. And we remain closely coordinated with the Governor and myself speaking twice a week. But, Mr. Speaker, high energy costs are not the only challenge 
confronting this country. Growth is not as high as it should be. This has made it harder to pay for public services requiring taxes to rise. In turn, higher taxes on capital, higher taxes on labour have lowered returns on investment and work, reducing economic incentives and hampering growth still further. This cycle has led to the tax burden being forecast to reach the highest levels since the late 1940s, before, before, before even Her Late Majesty acceded to the throne. We are determined, Mr Speaker, to break that cycle. We need a new approach for a new era focused on growth. Our aim over the medium term is to reach a trend rate of growth of 2.5 per cent. And our plan, Mr Speaker, is to expand the supply side of the economy through tax incentives and reform. That is how we will deliver higher wages, greater opportunities and, crucially, Mr Speaker, fund public services yeah. now and into the future. That is how we will compete successfully with dynamic economies around the world. And that is how, Mr Speaker, we will turn this vicious cycle of stagnation into a virtuous cycle of growth. So, as a government, we will focus on growth even where that means taking difficult decisions. Now, none of this is going to happen overnight, but today, but today we are publishing our growth plan. Today we are publishing our growth plan that sets out a new approach for this new era built around three central priorities. Reforming the supply side of the economy, maintaining a responsible approach to public finance, and cutting taxes to boost growth. Mr Speaker, the UK today has the second lowest debt to GDP ratio of any G7 country. In due course, we will publish a medium term fiscal plan setting out our responsible fiscal approach more fully, including how we plan to reduce debt as a percentage of GDP over the medium term. And the OBR, Mr Speaker, will publish a full economic and fiscal forecast before the end of the year, with a second to follow in the new year. Fiscal responsibility remains essential for economic confidence, and it is a path we are committed to. Today we are publishing <coughs> costings of all the measures the Government has taken, and those costings will be incorporated into the OBR's forecast in the usual way. The House should note that the estimated costs of our energy plans are particularly uncertain given volatile energy prices, but based on recent prices, the total cost of the energy package for the six months from October is expected to be around £60 billion. We expect the cost to come down as we negotiate new long-term energy contracts with suppliers. And in the context of a global energy crisis, Mr Speaker, it is entirely appropriate for the Government to use our borrowing powers to fund temporary measures in order to support families and businesses. That's exactly what we did during the COVID-19 pandemic. A sizeable intervention was right then, and it is right now. The price, the heavy price of inaction, would have been far greater than the cost of these schemes. Mr Speaker, we are at the beginning of a new era, and as we contemplate, and as we contemplate, that's right, that's right, a new era, a new era, a new era, and as we contemplate, and as we contemplate this new era, we recognise, we recognise, Mr. Speaker, that there is huge potential in our country. We have unbounded entrepreneurial drive. We have highly skilled people. We have immense global presence in sectors like finance, like life sciences, technology, and clean energy. But, Mr. Speaker, there are too many barriers uh, for enterprise. We need a new approach to break them down, and that means reforming the supply side of our economy. Over the coming weeks, my Cabinet colleagues will update the House on every aspect of our ambitious agenda. Those updates will cover the planning system, business regulations, childcare, immigration, agricultural productivity and digital infrastructure. But, Mr Speaker, we start this work today. An essential foundation of growth is infrastructure. 
the roads, railways and networks that carry people, goods and information all over our country. Today, our planning system for major infrastructure is too slow and fragmented. The time it takes to get consent for nationally significant projects is getting slower, not quicker, while, while Mr. Speaker, our international competitors forge ahead. We have to end this. We can announce that in the coming months, we will bring forward a new bill to unpack, unpick the complex patchwork of planning restrictions and EU-derived laws that constrain our, our growth. We will streamline a whole host of assessments, of appraisals, of consultations, endless duplications and regulations. We will re also review the government's business case process to speed up deci decision making. And today, we are publishing a list of infrastructure projects that will be prioritised for acceleration in sectors like transport, energy and telecoms. And to increase housing supply and enable forthcoming planning reforms, we will also increase the disposal of surplus government land to build new homes. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are getting out of the way to get Britain building. One of the proudest achievements of our Conservative Government is that unemployment is at the lowest level for nearly 50 years. But with more vacancies than unemployed people to fill them, we need to encourage people to join the labour market. We will make work pay by reducing uh, people's benefits if they don't fulfil their job search commitments. We will provide extra support for unemployed over 50s and will ask around 120,000 more people on universal credit to take active steps to seek more and better paid work or face having their benefits reduced. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, at such a critical time for our economy, it is simply unacceptable it is simply unacceptable that strike action is disrupting so many lives. Other European countries, other European countries have minimum service levels to stop militant trade unions closing down transport networks during strikes. So we will do the same and we will go further. We will legislate to require unions to put pay offers to a member vote to ensure that strikes can only be called once negotiations have genuinely broken down. And of course, Mr Speaker, to drive growth, we need new sources of capital investment. To this end, I can announce that we will accelerate reforms to the pension charge cap so that it will no longer apply to well-designed performance fees. This will unlock pension fund investments into UK assets and innovative high growth businesses. It will benefit, it will benefit Mr. Speaker, savers and increase growth. And we will provide up to £500 million to support new innovative funds and attract billions of additional uh, pounds into UK science and technology scale ups. Yeah. Now, Mr. Speaker, this brings me to the cap on bankers' bonuses. Oh. A strong UK economy has always depended on a strong financial services sector. We need global banks to create jobs here, invest here and pay taxes here in London, in London, not in Paris, not in Frankfurt and not in New York. All the bonus cap did was to push up the basic salaries of bankers or drive activity outside Europe. It never capped, it never capped total remuneration. So let's not hear and uh, sit here and pretend otherwise. It didn't cap uh, uh, total remuneration. So as a consequence of this, Mr. Speaker, we are going to get rid of it. Yeah. And to reaffirm, and to reaffirm, and to reaffirm, we're going to get rid of it. And to reaffirm, And to reaffirm the UK's status as the world's financial services centre, I will set out an ambitious package of regulatory reforms yeah. later in the autumn. But Mr Speaker, to support growth right across the country, we need to go further with targeted action in local areas. So today, I can announce the creation of new investment zones 
We will liberalise planning rules in specified agreed sites, releasing land and accelerating development. And, Mr Speaker, we will cut taxes. For businesses in designated tax sites for 10 years, there will be accelerated tax reliefs for structures and buildings and 100 per cent tax relief on qualifying investments in plants and machinery. On purchases of land and buildings for commercial or new residential development, there will be no stamp duty to pay whatsoever. On newly occupied business premises, there will be no business rates to pay whatsoever. And if a business hires a new employee in the tax site, then on the first £50,000 they earn, the employer will pay no national insurance whatsoever. That is an unprecedented set of tax incentives for business, Mr Speaker, to invest, to build and to create jobs right across the country. I can confirm to the House that we're in early discussions with nearly 40 places like Tees Valley, the West Midlands, Norfolk and the West of England to establish investment zones. And we'll work with the developed administrations and local partners to make sure that Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will also benefit if they are willing to do so. If we really, if we really want to level up, Mr Speaker, if we really want to level up, Mr Speaker, we have to unleash the power of the private sector. And now, Mr Speaker, now, Mr. Speaker, we come, we come to tax, central to solving the riddle of growth. The tax system is not simply about raising revenue for public services, vitally important though that is. Tax determines the incentives across our whole economy. And we believe that high taxes reduce incentives to work, they deter investment, and they hinder enterprise. As my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has said, we will review the tax system to make it simpler, more dynamic, and fairer for families, and we're taking that first step today. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the interests of businesses are not separate from the interests of individuals and families. In fact, it is businesses that employ most people in this country. It is businesses that invest in the products and services we rely on. Every additional tax on business is ultimately passed through to families through higher price prices, lower pay or lower returns on savings. So I can therefore confirm that next year's planned increase in corporations tax will be capped. Well, that was the UK Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng. He was on fire. He wanted to make the message of they would not hurt growth. They want to deregulate, deregulate, deregulate. Of course, that headline that was pretty much expected, but that is, I'm sure, making headlines across the board is really uh, he wants to deliver the growth plan with large tax cuts and he's cut banker bonuses requirements. That means that they're really trying by all their means. It's probably the biggest tax cut or tax regulation cuts that we've seen since 1988. We'll follow, of course, everything uh, from Westminster, the pound. I know uh, took a little bit of a leg lower, I believe, in the last couple of minutes. Now, let's also get back to politics in Italy. The nation is in a state of political flux. Mario Draghi, who brought with him over a year of domestic stability and a friendly, familiar face for the rest of the continent, is on the way out. Italy faces a prospect of a new government, and Europe faces a prospect of a fresh relationship with the country. Well, let's now go straight to Enzo Moavero he, Milanese. He's a professor at Lewis University and a former Minister of European Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor. First of all, if you look at what the UK is trying to do, deregulate to stump growth, what would you expect in terms of cap, you know, tax cuts, but also policies put in place by Giorgia Meloni? Well, I think that certainly Italy would need a deregulation. It's a longer standing uh, issue, but uh, if the new government uh, will be able to do that and to plan that uh, in a careful way, it will be very positive for the country. Uh, whether they will do it is another question, not only from the point of view or they would like to do it, uh, maybe, uh, even if it's not clear from the electoral campaign, but if they will be able to do it, really to carry it on. And this is uh, a big issue for the country. Because uh, Paolo Scordini was telling us basically whoever becomes the next prime minister has three, four walls around them. First of all, the spread, so markets will keep them in check. Uh, the EU recovery plan, they need that money, that next tranche in December, so there's parameters around that. And of course, the debt ceiling. Yeah, clearly this is a sort of uh, way forward which is already written, is already traced, is there. 
It is, uh, I think, uh, difficult for whatever kind of Italian government in the next future to uh, go away from that kind of road. Uh, the, the question is always, and this is true for every kind of government, uh, technocratic, as we say, in this country, or political one, whether the intention will be really brought to realization. And this is uh, the question. This is the big issue. Do, do you worry, and again, there are underlying currents, of course, of Euroskepticism. I mean, if you look at the three people that would be part of the coalition, it's anti-immigration, it's Italy first. I know that's not what they say to the markets or with institutional uh, international investors. Do you worry that they don't stick to those promises? It is a risk. Indeed, uh, it is a risk. Uh, the, the question is always between what you intend to do before and during an electoral campaign, before the general election, and what you are really able to do it. Uh, the coalition uh, agreement could also be a problem, even if they have uh, already uh, under, undersigned a sort of uh, uh, coalition uh, agreement for the electoral campaign. But one thing is uh, campaigning and one thing is governing. And yeah. there, I think, uh, there is still a question mark. But this is true for whatever kind of coalition yeah. already yeah. planned or new after the election. Thank you. Always so clear in your thoughts. Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Enzo Moavero Milanese there, professor at Lewis University, former minister of European Affairs. Now, of course, the other show in town is what we're seeing at Westminster with the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the UK, Quasi Quartan, um, confirming a planned increase in corporation tax cancelled that we knew he would say, but now, he's just Mr. confirmed Speaker. it now. We he's also the said that there are low the tax investment tax zones tax that tax could be set up in almost 40 areas. He's confirmed the cap on banker bonuses will be lifted. He's also said that the government will legislate to put new conditions on unions wanting to strike. So this could possibly be the biggest force of deregulation, of detaxation since we saw uh, since the 1980s. He is again saying that he's putting a growth plan with large tax cuts in place. We'll have plenty more, of course, on that. We'll see what that means for pound and uh, the GDP for 2023 and beyond. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Kriti Gupta, Katie Lines in New York, and Anne Edwards in London. I know they'll focus on pound and also this crazy volatility that we've seen in currencies and especially the strength in dollar. Do we need a new plaza court? We'll try to discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. It's been an exceptionally painful period. There's a lot of confusion. Um, investors are not sure uh, how this is going to play out. Maybe we can get growth, um, but it's still you know, going to be a tricky environment. We're finding real opportunities. There has been carnage in this market. We simply aren't in normal times. We are drifting towards global recession, and we are in global Bama. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Central banks had a big week. It's unlikely to be the end of rate hikes aimed at crushing record inflation. The UK's mini budget, the new government scraps a planned tax hike, puts a price on the energy bailout, and removes the cap on bankers' pay. We've got analysis and market reaction. And two days to go before an historic election in Italy. Giorgia Maloney is uh, seen uh, doing well out of this and could become the country's first female prime minister. We'll look at why she makes markets edgy. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta and Kayleigh Lyons in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And Chrissy uh, and Kayleigh, we're back to those uh, same themes, Kayleigh, around the strength of the dollar. That is certainly mm -hmm. still front and center. Absolutely. It's so interesting because we have seen a lot of equity action, including in Asia overnight where stocks were down broadly. Japan was closed for a holiday, but the MSCI Asia Pacific Index X Japan was down more than 1%. But as you say, the story really hasn't been in equities. Instead, it's been in foreign exchange as well as in the bond market. On the subject of the bond market first, of course, we saw, of course, we saw that monster move in Treasury.
treasuries yesterday up 18 basis points on the 10 year and you saw follow through in places like Australia and New Zealand overnight in Australia. The two year yield up a whopping 25 basis points to 338. That is a move of more than three standard deviations and then in foreign exchange. Of course, the big news yesterday was intervention to stem the weakness of the Japanese yen for the first time since 1998 on the part of Japanese policymakers. That seems as though it worked yesterday. Today, though, the dollar gaining back strength against the Japanese yen up about three tenths of 1%. We're back up at 142.83. It echoes what we heard from our guest yesterday in that intervention only works if you have buy in from other countries like the US and if the fundamentals aren't pointing in the opposite direction, which for the Japanese yen they are at the moment and really for currencies across the board as it is broad dollar strength, including the Chinese yuan, which despite the fact from the PBOC setting the a stronger than expected reference rate for the 22nd day in a row, still a weaker yuan today. We're at 712 to the US dollar greedy. Yeah, Kaylee, when you talk about that dollar strain, well, the way it reflects in U.S. assets is simply pressure on futures. Futures down about six tenths of one percent. But I want to look at the bond market because I'm going to argue that a lot of the action is more in the bond market. The equity reaction really a, a function of what you're seeing once again in treasuries. And that's why I want to look at the two year yield instead of the 10 year yield today. We're looking at 415 as we start to see economists broadly actually follow the lead of our very own Anna Wong of Bloomer Economics calling for a five percent terminal rate. As you see more and more of those calls come in, the two year year yield getting higher and higher 415 once again another uh, record high when it comes to two year yield going all the way back uh, to the early 2000s up about three basis points earlier in the session but as you start to see liquidity perhaps fade out a little bit it is Friday going into the weekend keep an eye on that two year yield how high can it go especially with a bond market and equity market sell offs nevertheless Kaylee already covered the dollar I won't beat it too hard but the Bloomberg dollar index up about five tenths of one percent and once again the reverse effects of that Anna is Brent crude trading with an 88 handle down about two percent pretty in line with the risk uh, action that you're seeing this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Nervous nerves about the global economy. And this has been weeks in the making, hasn't it? This uh, weakness we're seeing in oil prices as a result. This is the picture of weakness across European stocks today. So things worsening, actually, as we get through the European session. We're down by 1.2% in the London market. The Cacarons and the Zetrodax both down by around 9 tenths of 1%. We've been dealing with a lot of new information, a lot of new headlines coming through uh, from Westminster, from the new UK government. They've been talking about what they want to do on the fiscal side of things, a mini budget being announced by the Chancellor. Uh, and so I put the pound in my graphic to show you 111.92 down by six tenths of 1%. Interesting, just in the last few minutes, we've seen some new information about the, the amount of borrowing, guilt issuance the government wants to do. We seem to be seeing more tax cuts coming through than even had been expected. And we did just witness a big spike up in the 10 year guilt yield. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on those. But this is the pound reaction uh, that we're seeing at this point. Uh, the, the euro is under pressure today, down by seven tenths of 1%. So when we're thinking about where that dollar strength is, is being conducted certainly against the euro 0 0.97 we've gone to levels we haven't seen since 2002 on the single currency Brent crude critics already mentioned and Credit Suisse I put in uh, they had to, they denied uh, reports by other media about what they uh, are planning to do in their strategic review but just to underline uh, we're seeing an all-time low in this share price despite that denial a lot of uncertainty about the strategy at the business and we wait for another few weeks it seems until we get further details that stock down by 5.8 percent today let's focus in on what we've been hearing from Westminster let's get to Westminster to the UK Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng has uh, just been speaking, is still speaking, I think. Uh, no, just finished. And now we get a reply from the opposition. Uh, has been making that announcement about the government's economic growth plan in Parliament. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden joins us now with more. Lizzie, I, I was taken by the movement we've just seen in guilt yields. What, what stood out to you? Well, it felt like a full budget, even if it's not called one, Anna. Kwarteng started by confirming the energy support that's already been announced. Uh, the energy crisis, of course, at the heart of the cost of living crisis. But then he moved on to the tax cuts that we'd been expecting. So this was really Kwarteng showing uh, that the trust government is true conservative, as they'd like to put it, despite the energy bailouts and putting the new government stamp on the economy. So he said there are going to be more updates in the coming weeks. But what we've learned is they're lifting the bankers' bail bonus cap. They're scrapping the planned corporation tax rise. Uh, that's, he says, going to plow £19 billion back into the economy a year. He reversed the payroll tax rise. He raised house uh, property transaction tax thresholds. Uh, there's an income tax cut brought forward and he scrapped planned alcohol duty rises. So uh, lots of tax cuts here. A big focus on growth. That's the message that Kwarteng wants to uh, convey. But there could be a bit of a hangover. 
Lizzie, a, a key theme that's emerging around the world is this divergence between the, what the monetary authorities are doing, what the fiscal authorities are doing. How is the government going to afford all of this? Any color on that? Yeah, what we've learned is the UK is planning almost £200 of guilt sales this fiscal year. Uh, Kwarteng says that uh, the full costings are going to come out later, but he anticipates that there'll be it'll cost £60 billion for the energy package in its first six months, though he expects that to come down as they negotiate with suppliers. Uh, but crucially, this mini-budget fiscal event, whatever you want to call it, is not accompanied by a forecast from the official fiscal watchdog, the Office for Budget Responsibility. We had the chairman of the Treasury Select Committee, Mel Stride, on earlier. Uh, he had called for that to happen, but Kwarteng says no. Uh, so the vagueness continues. And lots of economists have raised their concerns about how much these measures will add to inflation, whether they'll actually boost growth much, and, mm. as you say, the borrowing that this is going to entail. All right, Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden, thank you so much for joining us on that breaking news. Massive reaction in the bond market, as Anna said. The 10-year UK guilt yield up 16 basis points right now. The two-year up by 21 basis points. It's been a wild week, including a blitz of interest rate hikes, and it's unlikely to mark the end of a campaign by central banks to crush inflation. Investors fearing that these hawkish central banks, including the Fed, will drive economies into recession. Former Goldman Sachs strategist Abby Joseph Cohn spoke on Bloomberg about that dilemma facing investors. I think we're now at a point where, given the significant rises in, um, in interest rates and yields across the yield curve since the beginning of the year, the equity market is now focused much less on inflation and yields than it is on earnings. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us now for more. And Danny, Goldman out saying maybe things are going to be worse than we thought. Yeah, look, I mean, Goldman is kind of behind. They're kind of playing catch up on this. Jan Hatzis, after the central bank decision from the Fed, upgraded his view of 75 basis points next month from the Fed before they saw 50. So the equity team over at Goldman needs to play catch up too. And look, I don't mean that as just a dig at Goldman. Everybody is playing catch up with the Fed right now, considering that those dots were a surprise to many folks out there. Now, Goldman, their call for year end is 3,600. They are specifically saying, look at what real yields have done. We've seen uh, for radio listing audience, I have a chart of the price to equity ratio for the S&P and 10-year real yields. It is inverted, but basically to show that these things usually track each other because when yields are going higher, when the discount rate is going higher, you have to discount future cash flow. So in theory, the S&P 500 needs to play catch up with this huge surge we have seen in the real yield. And look, equity investors, they're behind. They have to not just focus on inflation anymore, but what this current environment and rate hikes mean for earnings. So perhaps we haven't fully digested it, where, as you pointed out, Kaylee, the rest of the market, I mean, what a week of digestion it has been. Continue to see record strength in the dollar. The longest run of gains for the U.S. two-year yield in three decades. I mean, the U.K. two-year yield, which I also have on my board for our radio listening audience, of course, acting kind of crazy at the moment because of what we're hearing from Kwasi Kwarteng. But it is a global reaction. Again, Kriti, it's just equity investors really need to play a game of catch up right now. Uh, that seems to be a global story. Bloomer Sandy Berger, thank you as always for walking us through it. Let's go from the equity market to, well, Italy. Italy goes to the polls this weekend, bringing fresh uncertainty for investors, already fretting over rising interest rates and energy crunch and a potential recession. Bloomer's Francine Lacqua joins us now from Rome. I'm pretty sure she was in New York 48 hours ago. Francine, how are we set up going into this election? Yeah, thank you, B.A., and then I have, of course, not the jet lag, but the time difference on my side. <laughs> pretty. If you look at the polls, we can't talk about them, but it's pretty clear that we'll get some kind of right-wing coalition uh, with a majority making, uh, you know, Giorgia Meloni prime minister. Now, everything could change, but actually, given where we are, that's very likely. Now, she has tried to reassure the markets as much as she can in saying, look, I will stick to the plan put by Mario Draghi. We want those 1.9 billion euros that the EU will disimburse of course, in December, if they stick to the plan, they won't spend too much and they'll pretty much please the markets. But there is a bit of uneasiness because there's a lot that the market is questioning. She is a Eurosceptic by nature. She has not said anything bad about the Eurozone so far. But what if, once she comes into power, depending on the coalition partners, she becomes uh, the Georgia Meloni we knew three, four years ago? And that's the main risk out here. 
Right, and that's what the markets are focused on then, Fran, the relationship with the, uh, with the EU and what that does to the amount of money Italy can get. Yeah, I think they're focusing uh, high Anna, on four things. So, so first of all, the relationship with Russia, whether we're going to see, of course, a breakaway from what Mario Draghi was saying on Ukraine. Remember, he famously said, we have to choose between peace and air conditioning. What happens with this new government if we get into very cold months? They need to, of course, also look at the fiscal plans. So this is the debt. Uh, Italy has one of the highest debt in the Eurozone. We mentioned what the plan is for the recovery fund, but that means that they have to stick with 55 points that Mario Draghi has promised. And the other fourth question is that if there were to be a spread, a widening of the spread between Italian BTPs and German Bunds, does the ECB then activate their tool if it's because of political concern in Italy? And that, I have to say, is one of the toughest questions to answer right now. All right, Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua reporting from a beautiful Rome. Looking forward to your coverage throughout the weekend here on Bloomberg. Now to another company story we are watching this morning, FedEx cutting flights, deferring projects, and closing offices as it seeks to save as much as $2.1 billion to tackle challenges, including slowing demand and a tight labor market. The company reported first quarter earnings after the bell, after last week suffering its worst one-day decline in more than 40 years after it flagged worsening macroeconomic conditions. As for how that's translating into the stock in pre-market trading, it is not yet trading before the bell, but definitely one <laughs> to watch as that opens up and of course, when the start of trading begins here in the U.S. in about four hours and 16 and 17 minutes time or so, Anna. Okay, FedEx not delivering any pre-market excitement then. Let's uh, focus on what's coming up later in the program. We'll get a take on the markets. Max Kettner joins us, Chief Multi-Asset Strategist at HSBC. We talked about how other banks have been bringing down expectations for stocks. What does the higher yield environment mean to Max? We'll get his view. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta with Kaylee Lines in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is off today. Now, we got to talk about the currency market. I always love to do it. It's a pity Matt isn't here. He'd be making fun of me for it. But yesterday's story in the Japanese yen was crucial. The first intervention to support the yen going all the way back to 1998. For our radio audience, that's the chart that I'm showing here. We're seeing that intervention, like I said, going all the way back to 1998 to support the yen. But, of course, the BOJ has a massive history of helping the yen in the other direction. Direction. Here's what's crucial, though, and here's going to be the major question. As we talk about interest rate differentials really driving the trade in the FX market, perhaps from uh, as a result of the central banks, how sustainable is the concept of intervention? The idea that this is a market that trades $4 trillion a day. Back in 1998, the last time they did this, they had the support of the U.S. Treasury, the European authorities. It was a global coordinated effort. This time around, it is done one-handedly, uh, single-handedly, I should say. So the question here is, the BOJ is not alone. The BOE suffering the same thing as you see the pound really weaken. The euro, of course, we know having that parity conversation, perhaps going even lower. Can anything really be done on the central bank front? Let's ask our Bloomberg Markets editor, Lynn Thomason, who, of course, has been watching all things macro, but specifically the currency market. Lynn, what do you do when a currency has no support? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think um, you you really worry about where it's going to go. I mean, I think the interesting thing about the yen is that it's it's really sort of stood out, you know, with the BOJ is the one central bank out there that hasn't raised rates. Um, and you sort of wonder, I mean, like the intervention you said, it can only be a temporary measure. It can't be something that lasts forever. Yes, indeed. And uh, let me talk about something else that's been moving a lot, uh, and that is UK gilt yield. So um, this definitely very much a story at the moment because I'm still watching what's happening here. We've got up to 3.63 on the 10-year uh, UK gilt yield. I mean, we entered this year, Lynn, with a, a yield much lower than this. 10-year gilt yield started this year below 1%. I know that's a global story, yeah. but things are moving pretty quickly this morning on the UK story. What have we added to our knowledge? Obviously, we've got a package of measures to work through. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think you can sort of really think of the UK as like it's part of the global story, but it's everything to the extreme. I mean, the moves in gilt yields are huge. The pound is also taking a big loss. And you're seeing, I think, what everyone was worried about in
in, in the mini budget. I mean, there's really nothing mini about it in the budget that came out today. Mm. Um, you know, that the government is coming forth with this aggressive spending plan, really trying to cut taxes and accelerate growth. But I think a lot of people are worried that it's just going to accelerate the inflation picture. Right, and that is the government's point. They talk about this is going to be going for growth. They want 2.5% growth rate every year. That's what they try to do, supply-side reforms in the future and the like. But in the short term, does it seem as if gilt markets are focused on a, a bit of a lack of information because there is no OBR, Office of Budget Responsibility, forecasting to go along with this, as Lizzie was telling us a little bit earlier on, which is not usual. Perhaps it's usual in an emergency, fine, but this is a not necessarily such a mini budget. Yeah, I think that's the, the final takeaway. Um, and I think, you know, also, you know, investors are worried about how this is going to play into long-term borrowing costs, and that's being reflected in the gilt yields, um, that you're seeing those rise up just so much more than the rest of the world really speaks to the fear, I think, and anxiety that people have about the UK market right now. Speaking of fear and anxiety, you definitely have seen a certain amount of that reflected in the equity markets here in the U.S., uh, especially, Lynn. We've had Goldman Sachs now cutting their year-end S&P target down to 3,600. You're seeing strategists in Europe as well starting to pull back on their expectations for how well the European markets can do by the end of this year. Dare I say capitulation? I think that's starting to come into the picture, you know, especially with strategists tend to be a bullish group. They always tend to be forecasting gains. And I think when you've got strategists now cutting forecasts in mass, um, you know, it really speaks to the level of pessimism and, and worry that's in this market right now. And I think, you know, a lot of people are saying it's not going to turn around anytime soon. It's certainly not turning around in the future's picture, is it? It looks pretty red on the screen there. Lynn, thank you very much for that. Bloomberg's Lynn Thomason uh, joining us with the latest on these markets. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Central banks, it's a big week. It's unlikely to be the end of rate hikes aimed at crushing record inflation. The UK's mini budget, the new government, scraps a planned tax hike, puts a price on the energy bailout and removes the cap on bankers' pay. We have analysis and market reaction. And two days to go before an historic election in, in Italy, with Giorgia Maloney vying to become the country's first female prime minister. Uh, we will look at why she makes markets edgy. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta and Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And Chrissy, a lot of focus here in the UK on what's going on in FX markets, on what's happening in gilt markets. Uh, so uh, run us up to the uh, start of trade over in the US with what's happening in, uh, in, in equity markets. Yeah, well, it's a little bit of a ripple effect, Anna. When you see any kind of major movement in any sovereign bond market, of course, is going to have uh, some sort of effect into U.S. Treasuries as well. And that's exactly what you're seeing, the two-year yield climbing higher and higher, perhaps by a smaller margin. We're only about four basis points in the early trading, uh, in the U.S. early trading, I should say. But the two-year yield still at 416 basis points. As we start talking about a terminal rate that could potentially be at 5%, our own Anna Wong ahead of the call on that. The two-year yield is going to creep up higher and higher. The ripple effect of that is going to show up in the dollar, and that's where you're seeing the strength of about six-tenths of one percent, in addition to it reacting to, of course, what's happening in the U.K., the weakness in the pound driving the dollar higher. And then the ripple effect of that, one more domino effect, Kaylee, is, of course, what you're seeing not only in Brent crude in the commodity space, an 88 handle on Brent crude about down 1.8%. But also what's happening in futures, which brings us right back up to the top of the board here for our TV audience. Futures down seven-tenths of one percent, and really it does look like a cross-asset story. Yeah, well, you mentioned Brent. I would note it's really weakness across the commodity complex because copper is also down about three percent today. So as a result, any commodity-sensitive equities in early hours aren't doing so well. The likes of Freeport McMoran, Cleveland Cliffs, or Eclipse Natural Resources down 3.8 and 1.5% respectively. And then in the oil space, a lot of those energy players seeing some weakness today as well. Occidental Petroleum down 1.8% or so, as is Devon Energy. So a lot of weakness you were seeing in the energy and material sectors this morning, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. And that's reflected here in Europe, Kaylee. Uh, for much of this morning, we've seen weakness in energy names, basic resources. Overall, the stocks in Europe are weaker pictures down by 1.2%. As the morning has gone on through the last two and a half hours, things have got worse, really, for European stocks. Here's a couple of UK assets to focus on, as we've heard from the new UK Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, delivering his so-called mini-budget, but there were a lot of news lines in there. Um, this is the impact we've had on the markets. We'll go to the 10-year yield first. This was at 3.5% before he started speaking. 3.7 is where 
where we are right now. It seems as if taxes are either not going up or are coming down more than had been anticipated. We knew that would be the direction of travel, but there's a little bit more in there maybe. A lot of uncertainty as well about what this does to the UK economy. Does it deliver the growth that the government wants to achieve here or does it just build up debt? And that is something that the markets might be a little bit nervous about, especially as we don't have a forecast here from the OBR, something that market participants are used to. Uh, this is the pound response. So it was down by more than this. Paired those losses just a little bit. 111.95. Still a weak picture then for the pound relative to recent history. And Brent Crude, Chrissy has been through that one. Down by 1.9% this morning then, Chrissy. A lot of pain in the markets. It feels like there's no real place to hide except for the US dollar. A consensus trade that a lot of people are already saying is a little bit overcrowded. Uh, speaking of all the bad news in the markets, who better to bring in than Max Kettner, chief multi-asset strategist over at HSBC. Max, thank you as always for joining us. Is there any good news out there? Uh, I'm afraid not really right now, right? I, I guess the, the only good news that I could provide is that at some point, perhaps sentiment and positioning will become so extremely bearish. And at some point, no one's, no one's really going to find any kind of positive news and any kind of reason to buy risk assets. And perhaps that is exactly the reason why you want to buy risk assets then. The issue with that is that when we look at, it, at our aggregate uh, sentiment and positioning indicator, for example, it's still around sort of the 25th percentile. And just to give you a, a comparison, in the middle of June, uh, when we had this downdraft in risk assets as well, we were down on sort of the 8th and 9th percentile. So unfortunately, even from a sentiment and from a positioning perspective, even there, there's a bit of ways to go still. And from a fundamental perspective, I think uh, the big issue is we have this lose-lose situation. We have this situation that we describe as sort of uh, a tails you win and heads I lose kind yeah. of situation. OK, and, and bringing that to the UK, Max, very good to see you here in the studio here in London. We've heard a lot about the fiscal package this morning from Kwasi Kwarteng, the Chancellor, and it, it does seem as if the market is now a bit nervous. When you look at what the response has been in gilts, gilt yields have spiked considerably higher this morning. We're going to see quite a lot of issuance, whether that's borrowing by the government or quantitative tightening by the Bank of England, not issuance rather, but, you know, gilts coming to the market. Yeah, I guess the big issue is that net supply could really spike quite, quite a bit, right, going into 2023. So uh, we could end up in a situation where net supply is rising to a new record high. Now, with, you know, for the UK's uh, basic balance being so really challenged, that is not good news for the pound, right? It's not good news for the pound. It's not good news for, for gilts. Uh, now, funnily enough, that doesn't really apply the, to the UK equity market. It mm. does apply to the FTSE 250, right? Yeah. It does apply, apply to small and mid caps. To the FTSE 100, much, much lesser, right? Because it's much more international. So you okay. get the sort of defensive value from that. So maybe not too much of an issue for UK stocks for the reasons you mentioned, them being international. But it, does it add up to some sort of funding crisis for, 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 for gilt markets? Or are we not quite there yet, Max? I don't think we're quite there yet to, to, for, for a funding crisis. Let, let, let's bear in mind, right, let, uh, if we look a, a month and a half ago, you know, we had 10-year Treasury yields at 2.5. Uh, now we're almost up to almost up to four, right? Mm. A, month and a, a month and a half later. And I don't think, for example, for Treasuries, we would speak about a funding crisis either, right? Now, gilts, of course, have been the underperformer. It reacts to this sort of fundamentally more challenged situation in the UK. But I would still say, relative to the others, relative to bonds, relative to Treasuries, it's actually still pretty orderly, right? Actually, mm. when we look at it, not only the UK, look at BTPs, right? We heard from you before that, you know, the market is very, very worried about uh, uh, Italian elections. Mm. Actually, when we look at BTPs, CP bone spreads, right? They're sort of grinding around 220, 230 basis points. Mm. So it's sort of a slow, a very, very ever, uh, ever so slow gr grind uh, wider. But it's not really a panic situ uh, situation yet. Okay. Max, I want to go back to your idea that heads you win, tails I lose. Kind of the idea being that either outcome you look at, whether it's that the data holds up, so central banks have to be even more aggressive, that turns out to be bad for equities, or the data deteriorates, there's growth concern, that also is bad for equities. But I'm wondering if there's some nuance we can find there in that outcome A, it's higher rates, putting pressure on valuations, maybe more bad for growth stocks. Option B, maybe more bad for cyclar, cyclical stocks. Which do you think is more likely and how does that affect where within equities, even though I know you are underweight, you'd want to be shifting towards yeah I think um, so, so exactly how you described right we have this this most miserable of all situations where whatever happens right if activity data 
uh, uh, surprises to the upside. We're still going to get more from central banks. So valuation will be challenged. In that scenario, that is actually the much more challenging scenario. And I think for now, that is the more likely scenario still. So from an asset allocation perspective, it's much more challenging than the second scenario that we've got, the, the classic risk-off scenario. Because in that scenario, well, what do you do? You buy duration, you buy defensives, you buy growth over value, you buy investment-grade credit over high yield. It's, it's a classic risk-off scenario that we're used to from an asset allocation perspective. Mm. However, the first scenario is the much more challenging one because it means you can't really buy duration yet. That means that growth is also going to be challenged more than value. But given that growth is such a big part of the equity market, right, such a big, big heavyweight from a market cap perspective, that means it's going to challenge equities. By extension, it also challenges high yield. And the only place really to hide out is long dollar cash, long sort of front-end assets, so floating rate notes, short-dated investment-grade credit, right? And above all, really still the dollar and still dollar cash. Well, on the cash point, Bank of America publishing this morning, noting that in the week through Wednesday, cash had inflows of $30.3 billion. Max, what do you need to see? At what point is it time to deploy some of that cash to wade back in? How long do you wait? What do you wait for? I think, you know, first we've got to figure out uh, which, which regime are we going back to. Are we going into a risk off, right, into that classic risk off regime? So are markets at some point going to be scared no longer about inflation so much, but much more scared about growth? I do think that's the most likely scenario. So the most likely move is going and switching back from cash into really into sovereign bonds into duration, right? Once those uh, growth concerns really take over. That, however, is probably going to take some time, right? There is a certain lead lag relationship between mortgage rates, housing data, and then housing data and the unemployment rate. So it probably will take sort of another quarter, two quarters until we can do that. That is sort of the signs that I'm watching, perhaps housing market, how that really feeds through into the labor market. In reality, look at, look at yesterday's claims data, but really clearly not yet at that point where that is feeding through into these worse than expected uh, growth data that we have to watch out for. Okay, Max, thanks very much for joining us. Max Gettner, Chief Multi-Asset Strategist at HSBC. Coming up on the program, we'll talk about crypto. The bear market comes for crypto executives. We'll discuss the recent spate of CEO departures and what is ahead in the world of digital assets. This is Bling Bang. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with former Fed Vice Chair Alan Blinder. That's at 2.30 p.m. Wall Street time, 7.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. I'm excited for this next chapter. I'm extremely confident in David Ripley and his ability to, to lead this company. You know, he's been with us since we were 50 people six years ago, uh, all the way up to, you know, mid 3000s right now. Um, so, you know, he's seen it all. And uh, I'm, I'm just super glad that we have such a deep bench and someone able to, to step up from the inside. Jesse Powell of the crypto exchange Kraken speaking with Bloomberg earlier this week after announcing he will be stepping down as CEO to be replaced by COO David Ripley. His resignation is the latest in a string of crypto CEOs that are moving away from running their companies. The raft of succession sets the stage for a changing of the guard in the roughly decade old industry. Dmitry Chokarev, CEO of Copper, a platform designed to make cryptocurrency acquisition and safe storage easier for institutional investors, joins us. Now, Dimitri, before we get to the specifics of your business, if I could just ask you the succession question, seeing we have seen this wave of executives moving away seems to be signaling something about the toll it takes to be running a business in this volatile industry. How much do you feel that and what does Copper's own succession plan look like? Well, it's not surprising. Generally speaking, we see decentralized finance merging with traditional finance more and more and more and same rules that we see in financial markets start applying in crypto markets. Um, Generally, the move I, I think is, is a good move for Kraken, and um, you know, generally speaking, for Copper, we don't have such plans at the moment. But we are enhancing our executive team with more and more um, 
uh, team members from traditional finance. Mm, OK, uh, good morning, Dimitri. Good to see you here in London. Uh, let me ask you about the... Rela you, you clearly work at that relationship between the crypto world and the more sort of institutional asset world. What appetite do those businesses have for crypto at this point and for blockchain, given the crypto winter that we're in? Have you seen a marked deterioration of interest, given what's ha been happening? Well, if we take a more of a bird's eye view on what's happening generally, uh, because those are two separate things. The so cryptocurrency is one thing and different you know, yes. analysts we, we can, can tell you know, whether Bitcoin is going to go up or down, etc. If we talk about largely blockchain technology and what's happening there, um, this is not a party you want to be late for. This is absolutely massive uh, trans refor reformation that we're looking at uh, here. We have several centers of excellence in the world, right, where people know how to operate financial markets. New York, London, et cetera, et cetera. But there aren't that many. Blockchain removes that requirement. With blockchain, you can operate same volumes, but uh, with 20 to 50 times less people. Right. But so, but, but so during the crypto winter, and I take what your point about, you know, you don't necessarily want to talk about or know whether block, you know, uh, whether Bitcoin goes up tomorrow or down tomorrow. But has there been, because, but it is associated in the minds of many with, of course, the infrastructure uh, and, and blockchain is that. So do you see a reduced interest in blockchain or no? Do, do institutional executives know enough to separate the two? We don't see a reduced interest in blockchain. If anything, we have an increased interest in blockchain technology. Really, despite the winter? 100%, 100%. Yeah. But this is like email and internet, right? We're talking about 1995, whether people are still interested in email, etc. The larger play here is internet, which is blockchain. Right. Dimitri, if we could talk about the market angle here. Of course, we know central banks and uh, the news coming out of them around the world are all the rage right now. Bitcoin very tied to what you're seeing coming out of the mouth of Jerome Powell and his colleagues around the world. Your take on whether Bitcoin is actually becoming a mainstream asset when it comes to more macro events like rate decisions? Um, as I mentioned previously, um, I don't think this is generally important for blockchain technology as a whole. So Bitcoin is a completely beast on its own. This is one application of blockchain technology. There is a sentiment around Wall Street from buy side and sell side that we are seeing of all securities migrating to blockchain technology. This is completely independent uh, from Bitcoin. So, Dimitri, where does crypto broadly then, as, as, as an entire asset class, for example, really take its cue from? If you're looking at it from a macro basis, does it looking for technology stocks, is it looking at rates, other commodities, even the dollar maybe? Uh, does it take its cue from, from any other cross-asset relationships? From all of them. This is a completely new realm, essentially, but uh, you will see linkages across all asset classes to, 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 to crypto. It's not that you can't pick single-handedly one of them and say, hey, by the way, this looks like a commodity, you know, and everything uh, looks like a commodity. It would be one would look like a commodity, another one would look more like equity, another one would look like uh, hobbies on its own. Dimitri, thank you very much for your time to talk about uh, Bitcoin and the world of, uh, of blockchain, uh, more specifically around your business, of course. Dimitri uh, Takarev, the CEO of Copper, thank you very much for joining us. Um, let me just get to some breaking news that we have across the Bloomberg terminal, and this is in connection with what being announced uh, by the Chancellor, the UK Chancellor, uh, today in Westminster. The UK five-year yield has jumped 50 basis points. It's set for its biggest rise on record. We've been watching these yields rise. I focused on the 10-year earlier, but the five-year having this substantial gain set for its biggest rise on record. Uh, traders put a 50% odds on a 100 basis point Bank of England rate hike in Good November. Noise. They'd previously been, odd, uh, been suspecting 50 or 75, but now we seem to have a 50% chance of a 100 basis point hike from the Bank of England. The BOE saying through, um, uh, I think it was Jonathan Haskell saying just last night how difficult this fiscal package makes the job of the Bank of England. Our thanks to the CEO of Copper for that conversation around crypto. That's the latest on the markets. We'll be back with more on the reopening of Hong Kong shortly. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is off today. Kaylee Lines joining Lisa Bromwitz and Damian Sassauer in just a few moments for the next hour on Bloomberg Surveillance. Let's take a look at what we should be watching in the day ahead. We're going to get U.S. PMI data at 9.45 a.m. New York time and of course across the Atlantic. The U.K. Parliament goes on recess this evening ahead of Labour Party and Conservatives Party's conferences. And of course, Fed Chair Jerome Powell will make opening remarks at a Fed Listens event.
event hosted at the board in Washington at 2 p.m. New York time. Anna, a lot to digest, and it's only, well, not even 6 a.m. in here, here in New York. <laughs> yeah. 5.51, I think, for you. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's early. <laughs> Meanwhile, over in Hong Kong, it's a lot later than that, and Hong Kong is scrapping hotel quarantine for inbound travelers from next week. The most substantial move yet in the city's push to end its isolation. John Lee, Hong Kong's chief executive, spoke earlier. We also want to ensure that as we uh, progress, we can do it in an orderly manner. By introducing this new measure of zero plus three, obviously uh, this is a kind of relaxation from the three plus four. So we want to ensure that we will monitor the situation closely uh, so that all the risks are well controlled. Rachel Chang joins us, our Asia healthcare and consumer editor in Hong Kong. And for many people who live in Hong Kong, Rachel, this must be another sigh of relief. Earlier on this week, there was, there was talk of loosening of various regulations. How significant is today's move? Indeed, I think for, for all of us who live in Hong Kong, it's, you know, it's, it's, the, lo it's the end of a two-year nightmare, to be honest. I mean, the, it cannot overstate how hated this hotel quarantine system was, hotel quarantine. At some point last year, you had to spend 21 days in a hotel room just to get back to Hong Kong. It's been a massive reason why so many expatriates um, and talent have left the city to go elsewhere. And so, you know, it's a really a long-awaited move, and a long-anticipated move. And for residents in Hong Kong, it's a big move to allow them to travel freely again. Again, however, Hong Kong is still so far away from what the rest of the world are doing. So with the scrap of hotel quarantine, visitors will still have to spend three days sort of monitoring their health at home. They can move around, but they cannot enter restaurants and bars or places where their masks are going to be removed. They still have to do PCR testing almost every day. This is extremely different from the situation in Singapore, in London, you know, in the U.S., everywhere around the world. So, you know, that gap between Hong Kong and the rest of the world does still remain. Well, Rachel, it's no secret that China isn't looking to change their zero COVID policy anytime soon. What are the odds here that this gets reversed, that we actually see more quarantine times in the future, especially at perhaps peak exposure to the virus in, in, in the winter, for example? So I think thankfully for Hong Kong, you know, the, they've said many times there's no going back. Hong Kong is moving in the reopening, di reopening direction. China, of course, taking a really different pathway. And what we know is that the border between Hong Kong and China, that remains. People from Hong Kong have to do seven days hotel quarantine to get into the mainland, just like from any other place in the world. So, you know, China is still putting up its fences uh, to block people from bringing the virus in from Hong Kong. You know, what we do know is that it's quite clear now that Hong Kong as a city, if it wants to maintain its global financial status, if it wants to remain a gateway for people from the rest of the world into China, it has to take down these restrictions because it has to be closer to these rival financial hubs that are right now, you know, attracting all the business, attracting all the talent and making Hong Kong no longer a place to be if you mm. want to do business. Rachel, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Rachel Chang in Hong Kong with the latest on a changing regulatory picture around COVID. Uh, dealing with something very post-COVID here in the UK, and that is all around inflation, of course. Uh, the inflation fight, the story of yesterday with the Bank of England. Today was the fiscal fight, and we heard from the Chancellor. Uh, a lot of announcements coming through from the Chancellor, a lot of detail to be worked through, putting a price on the energy bailout. It's having a significant effect on assets. We've seen a surge higher in gilt yields. We mentioned the five-year gilt yield a moment ago. Ten-year yields also surged. The biggest jump on record in the five-year yield. Uh, the pound very much under pressure. Critty, we saw it drop down to a 110 handle on the pound before it just recovered up to 111, as you see there. It's still down 1.4%, though, Critty, on the day. The strong dollar, of course, has been has been uh, damaging to a set, in a sense to, to, to many economies around the world but but this is driven by domestic policy here in the UK. It absolutely is it's really a poster child for the issue you're seeing around the world this drift this divergence between a monetary authority and the fiscal authority if you're looking at the gilts by the way the 10-year gilt a 30 basis point move in just a 10-year yield Anna that has changed in just the last 20 minutes a flatter gilt curve of course a consequence of that. Yeah.
And the odds of a 100 basis point hike in November now stand at 92%, and that is failing to support the pound, which is uh, uh, very interesting for FX markets and what, what drives them. Thanks very much uh, for watching this early edition of Bloomberg uh, Surveillance. Uh, more, more surveillance uh, still ahead, of course. They'll continue to focus on what's going on in the UK assets because there is so much movement. Some spillover. We are seeing higher yields in other jurisdictions as well. So no doubt more on bond markets globally. This is Bloomberg.